If we've not yet met, my name is Bill Rector, and I am delighted to be the teaching pastor here at Highland Country Fellowship. And if it's your first time here and you get a second after the service, please come up and say hello. I would enjoy that very much. Uh, all life is worship. We worship something, right? Whatever it is that you worship for this moment, please put that aside and let us worship the Lord. And we do that together here, but really every waking moment, every breath should be an act of some form of worship to God. And we do that together. It brings us joy when we do that together to kind of inspire each other to worship. And that's so fun to see the the fellowship that we have together, the, the giving, all of the things that we do, the beautiful music, and of course, the study of God's word. The idea is written down 2,000 years be- before most of us were born. Uh, that's all you can figure in later what you think. Uh, these timeless truths that transform us. A lot of T's in that sense. What we're going to do, we go verse by verse through the, 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 the Bible. We are in the Gospel of Luke still. If you've been away for a while and you're back, we're in the Gospel of Luke. We're in chapter 13. And I'd like to pick it up in verse uh, 10, if you're following along. Luke chapter 13, verse 10. On a Sabbath, Jesus was teaching in one of the synagogues. And a woman was there who had been crippled by a spirit for 18 years. She was bent over and could not straighten up at all. When Jesus saw her, he called her forward and said to her, Woman, you are set free from your infirmity. Then he put his hands on her, and immediately she straightened up and praised God. Indignant because Jesus had healed on the Sabbath, the synagogue ruler said to the people, There are six days for work. So come be healed on one of those days, not on the Sabbath. The Lord answered him, You hypocrites, doesn't each of you on the Sabbath untie his ox or donkey from the stall and lead it out to give it water? Then should not this woman, a daughter of Abraham, who Satan has kept bound for 18 long years, be set free on the Sabbath day from what bound her? When he said this, all his opponents were humiliated, But the people were delighted with all the wonderful things he was doing. And this, beloved, is the word of the Lord, and the mouth of the Lord has spoken it. Uh, This is such a beautiful passage. There's really really two stories in here. There's a story of healing and a story of rejection, and they're woven together. And even without... Even with all the warnings that Jesus has given, there's a story of acceptance and grace and healing and a story of rejection. And it's, Luke has put this here for us to remind us that each of us faces a decision. And so the title of today's sermon is Decision Time. I hope we got something there. Yeah, uh, I couldn't resist the uh, fork in the road. Hard to get that thing stuck in there, too, I'll tell you. Hurt my hand. Decision time. Actually, you know, it's funny. We're in a political season, just in case you didn't know. I got my I Voted sticker on, just to let you know. I believe that it is your duty as a citizen. So, good. You want to honor a veteran, prayerfully consider and vote, okay? Okay. So that's, I want to encourage you to do that. By the way, I saw Ralph. Ralph had two of these, and he's from Chicago, so you figure that out. Uh, yeah, so don't know how that works, but maybe we can follow him to the line. Okay, I'm sorry. So this is an example Luke has set before us, a decision that we're all going to face, not a political decision, a decision of the acceptance or rejection of the Lord Jesus Christ. And this story that we read, this, this section of the gospel is so beautiful. You know, if you were a, a nine-year-old, I don't know how long it's been for some of you, but if you were a nine-year-old and you just had the innocence of reading this story for the first time, you probably wouldn't notice anything other than just a beautiful healing that's in this story, isn't it? And so before we talk about the other aspects of rejection, you know, this morning, with everything that's going on, with all, I, just, I need to talk to you about a healing. Can you, are you with me? I, I need to share with you about the beautiful healing. And then we'll talk about the other parts of this verse. 
The healing here begins in verse 11. And a woman was there who'd been crippled by a spirit for 18 years. She was bent over and could not straighten up at all. And one thing that I'll give you just a, 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 a hermeneutical hint. There's a good $7 word. When, as you're reading the Bible, and I hope you are, I hope you are reading and studying the Bible as part of your building your relationship with Jesus and doing that on your own. I love studying it with you this morning, but you can figure out we're not going to get as far as you need to go on your own, okay? So as you're studying that, when you see someone healed in the Bible, your antenna should be perked up. That's what this means, right? Your antenna should be perked up to look for a spiritual healing as well as a physical healing. Amen? And this is a, a classic example, right? And Jesus told us this in the Lord's Prayer, and I won't ask you to go through it. Beautiful prayer, right? Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy, uh, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Sometimes Jesus models things that we could never understand about the heavenly realm by doing them on earth. We, we saw that last week. There was a fig tree that modeled spiritual growth for us. And this is why he teaches so much in parables. See, there is indeed a heavenly realm. I, I don't know. I can't see it. 1 Corinthians 2.9 says, What no eye has seen. No ear has heard, and no human mind has conceived the things God has prepared for those who love him. Who of us can envision what the realm, the unseen realm of God? None of us can. Jesus mentions that he can tell us about it because he's been there, and he's the only one. And so he's trying to do that, and it's, it's difficult for us. So occasionally he will talk about this spiritual healing in earthly terms. And that's, I think that's pretty, pretty common. Uh, this is not the first time he taught through this. One of my favorite healings in the Bible is the, the paralyzed man who gets brought by his buddies and they go through the roof. Uh, the, the version that I want to tell you about here is in Mark chapter 2, beginning in verse 3. It says, Some men came, bringing him a paralyzed man carried by four of them. Since they could not get him to Jesus because of the crowd, they made an opening in the roof above Jesus by digging through it. And then lowered the man, the mat the man was lying on. That's determination, right? Uh, if Jesus was at a Bible study in your house and if it was that crowded and people started coming through the roof, you, you'd know something important was going on, right? When Jesus saw their faith, he said to the paralyzed man, Son, your sins are forgiven. Now, stop for a minute there. Can you imagine if you'd carried that? If you're one of the four guys, or maybe, who knows, some people think it was a group of brothers, they might have carried this man as many as 40 miles to get to Jesus. That's why they were not going away. And they set him down, and what is it they want Jesus to do? They want him to make him walk again. And, and they finally get to this Jesus they've heard about, and he says, son, your sins are forgiven. I just want you to think what these guys are thinking. Uh, that's great, but can you make him walk? Right? I mean, Seriously. And this is, this is what we need to do. But Jesus is using this to teach us. There's something going on up here in that heavenly realm. And then there's something going on down here in the earthly realm. And sometimes they shadow one another. Sometimes they indicate one another. We talked about this a couple weeks ago with baptism. The baptism we must receive is of the Holy Spirit. But we symbolize it by dunking ourselves in water. And that's a beautiful thing. It tells the world that this has happened up here on earth as it is in heaven. Amen? Okay, that's it. That's what, that's what we're supposed to do. That's what Jesus is going to do here. He said, son, your sins are forgiven. Now, there's something else about that phrase. Now, if you think about that for a minute, suppose Larry spills a cup of coffee on Donna, okay? And I say to Larry, you know what, Larry? It's okay. You're forgiven. Uh, Donna would have every right to say, excuse me? He spilled the coffee on me. And this is, this is the point. I can't go around forgiving other people's sins. That's ridiculous. Only God can do that. And the reason that only God can do that is because of the authority he has over all of us. Amen? Now listen, now some of the teachers of the law, verse 6, were sitting there thinking to themselves, why does this fellow talk like that? He's blaspheming. Who can forgive sins but God alone? And you know what? As nutty as these people are in rejecting him, they're absolutely right that. There's only one person that can forgive sins. And see, Jesus is doing this on purpose. 
And he goes on. And he says, okay. I, I hear what you're saying, even though you're talking to yourselves. Immediately, Jesus knew in his spirit what they were thinking in their hearts. And he said to them, why are you thinking these things? Which is easier to say to this paralyzed man, your sins are forgiven, or to say, get up and take your mat and walk? One of these is in heaven. One of these is on earth. And he's just challenging them. Which do you think is easier to do? Aren't both only done by God? Is, is the challenge he's making. He says, and so that you know that I have the authority to do this and do this, I'm going to tell him to get up his mat and go. <laughs> but I want you to know the Son of Man has authority on earth to forgive sins. So he said to the man, I tell you, get up, take your mat and go home. He got up, took his mat and walked out in full view of them all. You see the linkage? His sins were forgiven. You know, it really would be enough because this man, even though he walked, let's be honest, he died a few years later. I, I have it on good authority, right? And that's, this is the thing. Christ can heal us on earth, but the most important thing is that we be healed in the heavenly realm, which is where we're all headed. Amen? That's it. And it, you know what? I want to be really clear about that because some people hear that and they think, I don't believe that Christ can heal on earth. I've seen it happen too much. And the, you know, I think the dumbest thing you can ever do is say God can't do something. So I'm never going to say that. I'll bet you guys have seen that too. Church is praying for someone healing, and all of a sudden, my gosh, there's no cancer. There's no nothing anymore, and it is a miracle. That happens, and you feel free to ask your Father in heaven for it. But I've also, look, if we're honest, you've seen that it doesn't happen all the time, right? But this spiritual healing, that is always available to those who will accept it. It's always available. Because we're all going to die of our last disease sooner or later, right? Whether it's eating beef, too much beef jerky and chips or whatever. I, I don't really mean to make light of it. I don't. It's a serious matter. It's, it's a, it, it causes us suffering and pain. But, but it's, all, it's all, there's a sign from God right there. <laughs> and and that, that, but that's, that's the deal, isn't it? it We've said before, I hope you don't get tired of it. A hundred years from now, the only thing that matters about you is your relationship with Jesus Christ and that spiritual healing. Right? And by the way, I also think Jesus enjoyed teaching that he had the authority to do that. Just as an aside, occasionally you will hear people say that Jesus never really claimed to be God. I'm like, what? Matthew 28, 18. See, he says, I have the authority to forgive sins. He also said in Matthew 28, 18, then Jesus came to them and said, all authority in heaven and earth has been granted to me. Uh, what, what do you think he's claiming there? Other than to be God. And he has the authority to heal on earth. He has the authority to heal in heaven. And that's really even more important. So we go back to this woman in Luke 13. And there is a physical healing. And there's a spiritual healing. And we're told there's a direct relation this time. We're told... Both Luke tells us in chapter 11, he says that uh, she was crippled by a spirit. And Jesus himself confirms it in verse 16. He says, Satan has kept her bound. So this physical ailment is directly caused by a spiritual ailment. Not all, spirit, not all physical ailments are caused. There's the world, the flesh, and the devil. And sometimes a cold is just a cold and it's not a demon, okay? Okay. But, but, but there are times, and this is one of them, we are told explicitly, this is a spiritual matter that he's addressing with her. And he does it to, il to illustrate a point. That the greater healing is that. <laughs> uh, I, and we can count on that every time. I, I, I don't know, you know. When you submit to the Lord's will, you have to place your loved ones in, in the hands of him to determine. You know, Lord, I, I really, in the end, I want what is best for for you and your plan because the universe is about you and it's not about me and it's not about my loved one. But if you can find it in your heart to have them with us for a few more years, that's what we want. And it's okay to ask that. But you know, sometimes it's, it's the will of God we have to submit to. My favorite verse on healing is in Isaiah 53, verse 5. You're probably familiar with it. The NIV changes one of the languages, but you'll recognize it here. It says, but he was pierced for our transgressions he was 
crushed for our iniquities, the punishment that brought us peace was on him, and by his wounds we are healed. And the older versions say, by his stripes we are healed. Do you notice it, it doesn't say that he was pierced for our influenza. He was crushed for our genetic deficiencies, right? This, these two things are spiritual matters. Our transgressions is what he can heal us of, is what we're promised to be healed of. And, and our iniquities, <laughs> oh, thank God I'm healed of my iniquities. And peace, he brings us peace. Some, some people, their, their soul just strives like Sisyphus pushing a rock up the hill because they do not know the peace of God. And that's what he can bring us by his stripes. We're healed spiritually. So back to this woman. Verse 12, when Jesus saw her, he called her forward and said to her, woman, you are set free from your infirmity. Then he put his hands on her, and immediately she straightened up and praised God. Notice, you're free up here. And then he put his hands on her, and, and she straightened up. <laughs> uh, do you know, by the way, I can never get tired of talking about this. Do you know why Jesus put his hands on her? He doesn't have to. This isn't like the force, right, where he has to somehow direct uh, some mechanical energy that's being transferred. Jesus heals at a distance in John chapter 4. Beautiful story. Uh, a, a, a rich person comes to him and says, you've got to come back. My son's going to die. And Jesus says, no, he's going to be fine. He says, no, please, come. He's dying. And Jesus says, go, he's living. And the language is just that beautiful. Right? Several miles in between there. Jesus doesn't have to touch to heal this woman. So why does he? <laughs> you know why? Because he wants to. Because he loves her. He longs for intimate contact. I mean, why do you pet your dog? I know this is an imperfect analogy, but why? Really? And, you know, it's because there's a, there's a it's, it's weird, it's, it's asymmetrical, I'll give you that, but there's a relationship I have with my dog. And I want her to be comforted. And, and I want to pet her. I wouldn't pet somebody else's dog. You know, especially a stray dog comes up to you on the street. I'm, I'm, I'd be putting gloves on first. But the Lord longs to touch you. Will, you. will you remember that, if nothing else today? The God of the universe with the power to make everything, including your consciousness and all the stars, wants to have an intimate, personal relationship with you. And he's reaching his hand out to you, if you'll just accept it. You are one of his children. You are loved. That is a, is a vision worth remembering. So he touched her. Jesus touched lepers. He touched unclean people that he shouldn't have because he loved them more than the conventions of society. <laughs> so notice also that she immediately, you know, Luke's a doctor as much as we can tell. Paul refers to him as a doctor later on in the, in the New Testament, so we think Luke's a doctor. And, and there's some of his observations that kind of confirm that. This is one of them. Because I think the stunning thing to Luke is there was no rehab, there's no surgery, there's no take two olives and call me in the morning. Do you, you realize that? She's immediately healed. Atrophied limbs that Jesus touches are immediately able to be used because he, sim he doesn't simply restore the physical. He restores the logos, the knowledge that your brain would have to have in order to use that limb. I, I want you to be just awed for a minute, as Luke was, by the immediacy of the healing. Immediately, she straightened up and praised God. That's a good verse to put on a young person's graduation card. Immediately, they straightened up and praise God. <laughs> it's a good prayer, I guess, even if it doesn't. But the, and look, that should be our reaction every week. If you've experienced that spiritual healing and you've been walking with the Lord for a while, do you remember the first time it came over you? Do you remember the first time the peace of God filled your heart and you knew it for the first time? 
didn't you praise God? Don't you get it? That's why it's so beautiful to praise God together with you and these fantastic musicians and Sammy, right? (laughs) Sorry, I have to get one in each week. But there is another side. There is another side to this story, and we have to tell it. It's important. One of the reasons Luke put this here is because this illustrates, this is like an acted sermon in front of us. Because in the same way that it was so beautiful, this woman accepts and receives the healing of Jesus like we all do and praise God, somebody else rejected it. Verse 10 Going back to verse 10, it says, On a Sabbath, Jesus was teaching one of the synagogues. Okay, it's the Sabbath. Now, the Sabbath was invented for us to take a rest from our work. It was a way for human beings to demonstrate that they trusted God enough to provide for them, that they could forego the typical work that they normally do in gathering food and doing all of that stuff, and God would provide for them, and they would devote that time to honoring that God. That's the principle. Do you know what happened over time? The spirit of trusting God and praising God became a rule. And you know how you can tell? Because the rules begin with no, no work. Trust God. Praise him becomes no work. You hear the difference? And when you got a rule like no work, well, you got maybe some gray areas there. If there's no work on the Sabbath, is it work to light a fire? Is it work to uh, prepare food? Is it work uh, to walk to the next town to visit my in-laws? Please say it is, then I don't have to go. (laughs) Right? The, the, The Jewish law had become like the internal revenue code. And they clarified all these examples. Do you realize these guys had 39 different categories of what constituted work? And this is in the first century, right? And the laws and the rules honestly became idiotic. I'm sorry, I just don't know any other way to describe it. And some of them are still there. If you've ever been to New York or Jerusalem, you've probably ridden in a Sabbath elevator. On the Sabbath, there's a special key. The maintenance person comes, turns it to the Sabbath so that you don't have to work by pressing a button. You get on at the first floor and the elevator just magically goes from one to two to three to four to five and then back to four to three to two to one. And you can ride without having to work. Uh, You're laughing because that, I'm sorry, that is idiocy. But that's what happens when you elevate and you worship the rules Right? Paul warns us about people who worship the creation instead of the creator. That's what happened. They worshiped the internal revenue code of all these rules that they developed to the point where they outlawed God. You, you, you get it? You can't heal on the Sabbath, God, because that's against our rules. That's what they're telling the God of the universe. It is crazy. And it's a tendency of us as we read this verse to be critical of them and say, for say, boy, we're a bunch of idiots, and I just did it. But there's a lesson for us, right? We can all tend to that. The human tendency is to make rules. Rules can be helpful if you're trying to build discipline, I'm told, right? Rules can be helpful when you're trying to raise children. Sometimes rules clarify things that are important. But you take them too far, and rules will get in the way of relationships. And that's what was going on here. So Jesus heals this woman right in front of the guy who clearly believes that it's illegal for God to do this on the Sabbath. Verse 14, indignant because Jesus had healed on the Sabbath, the synagogue ruler said to the people, there are six days for work, so come and be healed on one of those days, not the Sabbath. Now, um, notice that he doesn't even address Jesus. He wants to go straight to the people and tell them to go away. Come back on one of the other six days, right? You know, if you've been studying and listening to what's been going on in chapter 11 and chapter 12, Jesus has been warning. You know, he says to these people, you people, steer people away from the kingdom. Huh? Yeah, like telling them to go away and not be healed on the Sabbath. This is an example of it. You, know, you, uh, you people are not producing fruit. 
I want to produce fruit right here on the Sabbath, and you're stopping me from doing it. If you remember all the warnings that Jesus has given, here it is right in front of us. Luke is acting it out for us. He's telling us, look at this. Do you see now that when Jesus says, I didn't really come to bring peace, I'm afraid that my coming will bring division because some will accept and some will reject. And this is it, right down the middle. He shows us an incident of that happening. Right? I will tell you one thing that's interesting, though. Jesus, I think, is still reasoning, trying to argue, at least with whoever's listening. That's why he goes on, I think, in verse 15. He says, the Lord answered him, you hypocrites. And and notice that that's plural. So this man, this synagogue ruler, is representing a group of people in this crowd. You hypocrites. Doesn't each of you on the Sabbath untie his ox or donkey from the stall and lead it out to give it water? Okay, so one of the clarifications of the rules that they worshipped was, what about our animals? Well, you know, you shouldn't bring any harm to your animals. So I guess it would be okay to untie your animals, let them go down and get some water or some food. Okay, on the Sabbath, that'll be okay. And that, that was contained in something called the Mishnah, which are these, these thousands of clarifications on the rules. And Jesus says, you make an allowance so you don't hurt your animals. This woman has been bound, right? Instead of untying it, this woman has been bound by Satan. And you, you're going to forbid her from being healed and let go? And you notice that he also, he, he escalates this. This isn't just you and me disagreeing. I, I, he warned them before, you're either with me or you're against me. And if you're not gathering with me, you are scattering. And this is it, buddy. I'm sorry, I inserted the buddy. Right? This woman is bound by Satan, and if you oppose me letting her go, which side are you on thus? Amen? Boy. Other times, Jesus reasoned. You know, this isn't the first time that he he got into this argument about the Sabbath. He says in Mark chapter 2, in verse 27, he said, the Sabbath was made for man, not man for the Sabbath. And that's really, you think about that logic. This Sabbath was made for man to rest and worship God, not for man to worship the Sabbath. And and later on in Mark chapter 3 and verse 4, Jesus asked them, which is lawful on the Sabbath, to do good or to do evil, to save life or kill? Right? Think of what you've done here, guys. Think about the rule you've created. Like I've I've joked sometimes about waking up a patient to give them their sleeping pill. You've created a rule here that makes it unlawful to do good. Are are you catching this? And what he's trying to do is reason with them. But there are people, we just, we got to tell you, there are people that are simply going to reject God. They're not listening to reason. Trying to reason with someone who has got an emotional rejection is like trying to play golf with a tennis racket. The tool is unsuited to the reality. You can't reason with someone who's being unreasonable. And Jesus, unfortunately, we see that here. Actually, all this did was make them mad. Verse 5, he looked around at them in anger, deeply distressed at their stubborn hearts, and said to the man, stretch out your hand. This was the man with the shriveled hand. Jesus said, stretch out your hand. He stretched it out, and the hand was completely restored. Jesus is just, I can't believe you guys are so stubborn. You're not going to miss this. Look at their reaction. Then the Pharisees went out and began to plot with the Herodians how they might, that word's right, kill Jesus. This is a fork in the road. This is decision time. Unfortunately, the world we live in is fallen. It is influenced by Satan. It is full of greed and things that we know about. And we either choose to accept the healing of Jesus or we become a part of his death. We become a part of his undoing. We aren't gathering with him. We're scattering. (laughs) And that's the conflict. It's not just a little one. Frankly, it makes today's political arguments look tame, like playground squabbles. Are you going to accept the God of the universe that's made a way to heal you, or are you going to reject him? Healing One woman received the gift of God in healing. One man rejected it. And if you derive any pleasure that the woman was right and the man was wrong, go right ahead. (laughs) All right? This is the way it is, I think, with all humanity. 
That's the decision laid before all of us. This is a gr- big crowd of people. There were thousands, and some of them rejected Jesus. They were the ones that Jesus said, you hypocrites. But you know, uh, some of them accepted. Verse 17 gives me hope. Something I could desperately use some days. When he said this, all his opponents were humiliated, but the people were delighted with all the wonderful things he was doing. Is that you? Have you been healed, and are you delighted today with the wonderful things Jesus is doing today in your family, in your neighborhood? This is the way we ought to be, to straighten up and praise God, right? Let's, let's all, let's be delighted today with the wonderful things God has done and continues to do in our life. Not because we deserve them, <laughs> because he loved us enough to reach out in our condition and touch us. Let's pray. Father in heaven, how grateful we are for your love towards us, your healing touch on our soul. We can feel. We feel as we're together now. Help us feel that throughout the week. You found us at our worst. We were unclean, like spiritual lepers, and you were not afraid to reach out and touch us and love us. Allow us to feel that touch in our spirit give you praises all this week as the right response to you. In Christ's name we pray. Amen.